Hey there, thanks for tuning into Duck Bricks. I'm Chris, and today we are going to be taking a look at one of the most interesting development documents of LEGO Bionicle never seen before until now. This is the Bionicle story. So what is this document? Well, I think the best way to describe this is that let's say you're working on a job. I'm a program manager at Microsoft, so I've sent out a lot of emails that celebrate the launch of a new project and basically hype it up and say how good it's doing, how good it's selling. This feels and reads a lot like that. I haven't read it, but I did skim it so I know what to talk about in the intro. And there is a lot of talk, very interesting talk in data analysis, on how well Bionicle performed compared to other LEGO themes, how well it was doing in particular markets. So it was like 20% of the Europe market, and then like 10% of Asia pack, Europe North is 30. It's a lot of crazy information here. And this is basically, from what I understand, an internal document explaining to stakeholders in LEGO, business stakeholders, what Bionicle was, why it was made, how successful it was monetarily, and what were their plans moving forwards into 2002. So this is a document that originated near the end of 2001, which kind of summarized how well Bionicle did as a major product launch. This is the kind of internal document that is crazy to me, that is so interesting that never ever sees the light of day. Like you will never see something like this be published anywhere, except for the fact that Christian Faber actually gave me two copies and told me to actually do a video going over them. So first of all, thank you so much to Christian Faber for taking us out and actually showing us all these documents. I have made a series of videos, which you can find an entire playlist for linked in the description below about our journey, about him giving us a tour around Copenhagen, about original Bionicle style guide documents about original Bionicle story Bibles. And this is just one more that I find to be really interesting. And as always, I'll be reading this and reacting to it pretty much at the same time during the video as you all will be. I've done my best not to read these in detail before actually doing videos on them so we can kind of experience it together. And without further ado, let's jump in to the Bionicle story, which actually has little to do with the lore of Bionicle and a lot to do with the financial success of Bionicle because that's a story that Lego likes. Okay, so here is the document we are looking at today. It is called The Bionicle Story. From what I can gather, this was an internal document within the LEGO group that was basically given out to employees that explained how Bionicle was impactful. I assume this was also given out to stakeholders. It's a little bit more, I would say, professionally put together than a lot of the other documents that we're going to see, which are purely internal, just within the internal team. This seems to be something that the marketing team or the sales team put together to basically just explain what Bionicle was and what they were planning on doing with it in the future. And as such, this kind of goes over the origins of Bionicle, how it came to be. There's a lot of interesting like market research on how kids connected to Bionicle here. So. It's definitely a really interesting one, and this is a really special one because I actually was able to receive two copies of this. One of them was signed by Christian Faber that is going in my private personal museum forever. I mean, maybe not private. It might be public at one point, um, but it's going in my own collection. That is never going to be given away or anything, but for this second copy... It is another copy of something I was already given with a signature, so I feel like I might be able to be convinced to potentially turn it into a giveaway or some sort of a prize in the future. I don't know if that's going to be for a future Bionicle fanon contest. It may be a giveaway when we reach something like 200,000 YouTube subscribers. I really don't know. Um, but this is another copy of something I do have, so I do want to get this in the hands of fans and the community, so we'll have to see exactly what I'll do with this, but I am very excited because this is a really, really cool piece of LEGO Bionicle history. Very, very exciting, and let's get into it. So the first thing is kind of uh, that a little bit of an overview here, and I ha again, I'm kind of really only reading this in depth right now. Um, I have also uploaded a PDF of this document on Biomedia Project, which is really, really great. Thank you to BMP for sharing this, so really do appreciate uh, being able to partner with you and actually go through this document together. Uh, but first of all, so it says, one of the five companies, uh, one of the LEGO company's five core values is learning. So they're trying to basically learn uh, to that end, they are going to be producing an annual learning case based on their most significant and innovative launches. This is the very first one, which was 2001 launch of Bionicle. 
So that's kind of what this is. This is a case study that was put together somewhat professionally and sent out to internal LEGO employees. They were asked to share it with colleagues across the organization and hopefully take a step towards becoming a global learning organization. So this is basically kind of, they were taking their most successful thing from 2001 and saying, hey, this is what went right, do this for your other themes. And I'm kind of curious what other documents like this exist. I mean, if there's a Bionicle story, is there the Lego Star Wars story document somewhere out there? Is there like a Lego, I don't know, like a, even as far as like a Lego movie story? I don't know. So I'm really curious because this seems to be the first in many types of brochures and as someone very interested in Lego history in general, I find that very cool. Uh, first of all, though, we have the origins of Bionicle. So in 1997, I think a lot of this is generally known. I think we know this information, at least in this paragraph. Uh, there's some more information here that I don't think we've seen before. But here I think we know that. They were trying to target boys with shorter attention spans. They wanted instant gratification. They have historically found them difficult to attract, so they wanted to have pocket money prices. Um, good luck trying to do that today. I mean, if you're doing a Toa today, that's like 30 bucks. But back then it was a little bit more doable. And they also wanted to make it uh, relevant by reducing building complexity and balancing construction play and role play. So Slicer was the first test case. Uh, they then had Robo Riders the next year. They were actually combining construction toy and action hero. So construction actually was coined all the way back then. Uh, but even as they were being launched, they were still trying to develop a third generation of products. And that is, of course, Bionicle. So. Compared to Slicer, they really wanted to make the figures visually distinct and emotionally appealing with masks and tools. They also wanted to develop a story that was owned by the LEGO group, where it was an integral part, and they actually literally, there you can see, I did not know Construction was being used this early, but Construction Heroes was literally the term that was used here, which is very, very interesting to see them actually use that word as early as 2001. Um, and then they have these bullet points here. So they said, lifespan of at least five years and add a new chapter every year. So I think this is, I know that they were trying to first make Bionicle one year and then three years and then five years. There was a lot of back and forth in terms of how much time they were going to spend on Bionicle, but at least by the time this document came out, which, does this have a date? 2002. So by 2002 at some point, they were planning on five years at a minimum. Now LEGO does things with a three-year time span. So Chima, Nexo Knights, and even Ninjago were all conceptualized with three-year time spans, which I guess LEGO felt was a little bit more realistic just in case it didn't go well, with like Nexo Knights, where if it wasn't as popular, they can cut short the story a little bit early. Uh, here they wanted to make it an IP, intellectual property, and really tried to push it strongly. Uh, and Biological Chronicle is their Bionicle. So moving onwards, what is Bionicle? So they were trying to bring together construction, action figures, and storytelling. A lot of these is pretty self-explanatory thing. So storytelling, they really wanted to kind of make it be felt through Lego bricks. And they're li li literally building themselves together as bricks and working together and whatnot. Uh, so this is all pretty much standard. Uh, the lesson to be learned is find the power within yourself and you will succeed. The idea of the brick leads to the heart of a story. That was, that sounds like a Faberism. I would not be surprised if that was something Faber came up with, but that was what that was. Now over here, uh, they say each character has a unique personality, blah, blah, blah. When they see a Bionicle logo or icon endorsed by Lego, they know what values are inherent and what to expect, uh, which is why they felt like it was important to have the Lego logo on there because people knew to trust the Lego brand. So, okay, this is interesting. Uh, boys age 7 to 12, it is the only collectible line of action heroes that combines building with a continually evolving fantasy story, which gives it a very distinct competitive position. This is where, like, this is the interesting stuff to me. Like, as somebody who, um, one of my majors in college was business at the Wharton School of Business, this is, like, pretty interesting stuff to actually learn about. This is what LEGO internally was trying to figure out. What is our competitive advantage? What's our target market here with Bionicle? And that's really what they were trying to build out with the whole Bionicle story right here. Now, here is probably the most interesting thing to me. These next two pages are very, very interesting because this information has never been made available until now. Okay, so first of all, Bionicle was the best-selling self-created property ever. 
they made a solid contribution to the Lego company's return to profitability. Uh, they exceeded 1.2 billion DDK, uh, I guess that's DKK now, uh, contributing more than 10% of the Lego company's turnover, and they were 85% higher than originally budgeted for sales. So market turnover, this is quite interesting because I think that this is a very good indication of how popular Bionicle was in different regions. Uh, so East Europe, 20% highest, then America's. I'm into, I'm actually curious about that. I would have thought America's might be a bit higher, but I guess if you think about it, a lot of Bionicle fans are from Europe. Uh, Europe North, 13%, Europe Central, 11 Europe South, 11 So if you combine all the Europe, like, that's a, that's a massive chunk, right? That's like... It's 22, uh, 35, that's like 50, over 50% 50 all Europe. As compared to the Americas, North and South, 16%. That is pretty crazy. 10% uh, Asia Pack, which I guess LEGO didn't have a big presence there yet, so that makes sense. And then LEGO Direct, 5%, so I guess that's online. Uh, so in 2001, more than 70 million units of Bionicle branded products and merchandise were distributed. Play materials, trading cards, board games. This, okay, this is probably one of the coolest things to me because this shows literally exactly how well Bionicle did compared to other themes. This is the kind of information that we never, and I mean never, see LEGO publish. Like, LEGO, I cannot remember the last time that they actually published something like this. This is pretty crazy because this says, this is literally ranking, stack ranking LEGO themes and how well they were performing. So, uh, Bionicle 2001... Well above Adventures, Life on Mars, Sports, Wild West, Space, and Rescue. So that's quite interesting because Adventures being up there makes sense because I, I think there's a lot of Adventures fans. Sports doing better than Space and Wild West is very interesting to me. That is, I mean, that must be why they continued it onwards until like 2003-04 because it was doing so well. Um, so that's new information. That's cool to know. Life on Mars outperforming sports is also interesting to me. So... That's quite interesting, like all of this, but they're all about the same, right? And then Bionicle like more than doubled everyone else. So that's pretty crazy. And they were estimating 2002 to be even better, which is accurate, I think, because 2002 was a record good year of sales for Bionicle. So that is really cool. Uh, consumer reach has been dramatically extended. So the average age is 10 and eight years, which is higher than normal Lego consumers. Uh, okay, so, so yeah, and that's in US and Germany. Wait, so research, the average age of consumers is 10 and 8. They're estimated to range in total from 4 to 14. So if you're over 14 and watching this video, you should no longer be playing with Bionicle. <laughs> of course. But uh, Bionicle achieved approximately 25% total global penetration of the target group. For, that is like, as, as someone who like, went, like did some classes on marketing, like that is insane. 25% global penetration of your... Of all boys 7 to 12, that is that is nuts. That is wild success. Uh, created a large number of heavy collectors. Yo, Duck Brick shout out in official LEGO media. Um, uh, Bionicle has also contributed to achieving the overall goal for the product category. Okay. Uh, buzz of the toy industry, they had a very positive effect on their position in the toy market, and they have confidence in building industry-leading, story-driven concepts. Okay, this is actually interesting, because this is how Bionicle compares to... 2001 action figure sales in the US. So Power Rangers got Bionicle beat, but Bionicle did crush G.I. Joe, uh, WWF, and rip Gundam Wing all the way at the bottom. So Power Rangers still doing a little bit better, but you know, it was neck and neck. And being the second best action figure theme in from a company that did not specialize in action figures is honestly very impressive. So very, very cool that they did that. Uh, Bionicle has been recognized as an innovative concept throughout the history. They got a lot of awards, which you can see right there. High-profile global partners. Of course, you've got McDonald's, uh, Nike for the shoes, Universal Music, Scholastic, and Upper Deck. Yeah. Um, okay. So this is very funny because this is internal market research. Do you think Bionicle makes Lego more cool? 75% said Lego is more cool because of, of Bionicle. Lego is more popular because of Bionicle. So obviously this was helping boost Lego's brand in a customer segment they did not normally, like, really go in-depth into, right? Like, this is the segment of boys who did not really care about Lego, who didn't really care about building, wanted a cool action figure to play with, and that's what they got. 
Now over here, uh, Bionicle, uh, do you think Bionicle makes Lego that... So this was asking boys' mothers. Um, so they asked people's parents how they felt about Bionicle. Um, I don't know the sample size here. I'm kind of curious about what the sample size is because uh, I'm sure... I mean, it's uh, Millward Brown. I wonder if we could still dig up that old case study. But yeah, don't know what the sample size is, but good percentages. Um, Bionicle's impacted Lego brand inventory, making it more than a building toy. Brand equity, positive effects at all levels of the brand pyramid, very, very nice. And yes, this is their very first instance of calling a theme a Big Bang theme. So this is a, a Big Bang theme, and they have instilled internal confidence in their ability to focus resources on a priority and succeed in creating a craze in the toy industry. <laughs> this is very funny to me. So, as part of a growth strategy for the U.S. market, the Desert Storm Task Force chose Bionicle as a top priority for 2001. This is the first time I'm hearing of such an internal name as that. I suspect that that is some internal name for some team at LEGO. But I find it really funny how somebody at LEGO was like, yes, let's name our internal teams for our children's toy after US military operations. We are, we are the Desert Storm Task Force and we, we are behind Bionicle. In fact, if you slander Bionicle's name, the Desert Storm Task Force will come after you. Um, so they've got, they've got them there. Very, very official, big capital letters, very funny. Uh, but yes, Big Bang was a launch concept that allowed them to receive the largest marketing budget in the history of the company. That's crazy. More than Star Wars? Really? Really? For That's crazy. Because Star Wars was 1999. Huh. Okay, uh, that's interesting. They've sh uh, it's proven that LEGO was able to mobilize the company to implement a Big Bang project, uh, record-setting marketing budget, and the entire company was mobilized behind Bionicle. They are able to leverage it globally. That's how it's done. That is how to make Bionic Bionicle successful. Wow, okay. This is kind of almost like bittersweet to hear because obviously so much has changed now. Like, this is kind of sad almost. But uh, anyways, we have more because they wanted to make Bionicle way cool. Uh, way cool, man. You know, Yo-Yo Paraka finding its early roots here. So how cool is Bionicle? This is based on a consumer marketing campaign. 9% uh, of you you losers said Bionicle is not cool. Uh, so 9% so of you hate fun. 10% um, is less cool than Favorite Toy, which I'll give them that as long as the Favorite Toy is Lego. Um, but yeah, so, so more cool than their Favorite Toy was 47%, which is a pretty significant number. So again, don't know what the sample size is, but it's very cool to see that. And they were really trying to reach a lot of new customer segments here, which is very, very cool. Uh, so lessons learned. What did Lego learn about this? This, Christian Faber was explaining this is very, very important. Uh, the story drives a product, which drives a story. They drive the marketing, story drives marketing, and it's all a triangle that is kind of um, a whole intermixed thing, right? A change in the story would lead to an adjustment in the product assortment and the marketing mix and vice versa. A result of this working method is the story starter, a canister drifts ashore on the island of Mata Nui. Um, so obviously they really wanted to make this feel like you are building the character on the beach. And that's why the building instructions make it look like they're standing on the beach because that was part of the story. So that was really, really something they spent a lot of time figuring out. Um, in this mass communication strategy, the first part of the storyline is communicating print ads, cinema spots, and on Bionicle.com. Cinema spot? This was played before movies? Imagine walking into a movie in a theater and seeing this play. Oh my goodness, that would have been crazy. Um, an adventure game, yeah, Mana Nui Online game, very cool. Interesting how they don't have a mention of the cancelled game, which obviously, as we now know from the story bible, was a driving force behind a lot of Bionicle effort, but LEGO cancelled it last minute. So, that is quite interesting. Um, to, 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 so, marketing people were given detailed selling and material, campaign elements, and the concept video. I think that's this one, right? That's this video where the, the light moves. Um, they also have these Bionicle sell-in posters. I don't think these were ever used, because these are obviously early concepts with the Mask of Time, but uh, Christian Faber has since published these, so that's very cool to see that there. And this is where we get into the whole, like, internal corporate stuff with the cross-functional team you've got all these different team members uh so that's pretty that's a lot of like in-depth corporate stuff but that's very interesting to see they had an entrepreneurial approach within the global team to create the same kind of drive motivation attitude to bring it together uh so very cool there they were allowing it to make fast and correct decisions okay uh visually attractive materials so 
to support the feeling of a movie, the entire Bionicle universe was created in 3D. I mean, this was 2001. In 3D, that is crazy. Uh, yes, but that was what they were doing. And this is very fun. So, this is marketing innovation. Uh, they had grassroots mechanics like the implementation of the Mask of Power mobile tour had a big buzz effect. They had alternative media, such as CD-ROMs. Uh, so yes, this was this was a different age. This was 2001, but that is the mobile tour. I want to know where these masks are. Where can I get these masks? Um, if someone is selling these masks, do let me know. I, I I would love the how or or the Akaku. I mean, really any of them. I'm sure that some of them are still around. Um, but yeah, very very cool to see that. Of course, you have the Bionicle. Oh, I want the Bionicle socks. Oh, I, I want all this merch. Okay, very, very interesting. Um, but here is awareness of Bionicle in various media, which I also find interesting because uh, they've got a lot of different things here. So TV was a big impact. Uh, how people found out about Bionicle, TV. But then McDonald's was the third biggest, which is really crazy because... Obviously, it was a Happy Meal toys, and I have heard a lot of stories of people getting into Bionicle because of McDonald's, so that's how it works. <laughs> skateboard events, you know? You got to get that 1% in there, you know, skateboard events. Uh, but storytelling, it is a unknown, mysterious universe with legends, heroes, mass, and a mission against evil. It is a profound story that cannot be translated into a 30-second commercial. Um, so this is very interesting. With neither a movie, TV series, or books available... So they didn't have, like, any of those to begin with. The only way they could communicate it was via traditional and alternative marketing channels. Um, so they had a media mix and whatnot and drip-feeding parts of the story to maintain interest over time. Uh, so they have a wide media mix, all media carrying a different element of the story. Very interesting here. So obviously I have a bit of a graphic here with all of the different uh, bits and pieces of this uh, Bionicle puzzle, that, so to speak, a story mosaic. And it was not possible to control the order in which they were exposed to the story, because children could like see all of these in different ways, right? They'll read a random comic, they'll go to a random event, they'll see something on TV. Um, so they really had to like have each part stand alone, and as such, it was storytelling the Lego way. You're literally building it. I like that a lot. Um, okay. Over a third of our sample has seen two or more of the main pieces, more if we include the McDonald's promotions. That was a huge thing. I wish LEGO would still do McDonald's stuff because that was amazing. Uh, breaking new ground and making mistakes tend to go hand in hand. Oh, I wonder if this goes over any mistakes they went over. Okay, it has mercilessly revealed that LEGO is still a lot to learn. It's incredibly resource heavy, uh, where deals have been put together too quickly and without sufficient attention to the substance and execution of the consumer proposition, uh, we have essentially failed to produce any value. One such example is the first joint product brought to market together with Universal Music. Wow, they're really roasting the first Bionicle album there. Yeah, I guess that was um, without any value. Wow, that's they, they were just really, really roasting that. Okay, I guess that makes sense. That wasn't a huge thing. Um, forecasting the sales of a hot property like Bionicle is a major challenge because you have a huge inventory and investment risk. Um, yeah, so that's a really, really hard thing. Uh, sufficient stock, uh, su suffered significant stockouts on Bionicle during fall 2001. So they, they did not have enough stock. Well, that's a, it's a good problem for a company to have, to not have enough stock of something because it's so popular. That's, that's all right. Lego, you're, that's, that's a good thing. Uh, the story continues. Okay, so this is the plan for 2002. Um, O3 is having a direct-to-video film and a Nintendo GameCube state-of-the-art game. Major new developments. Oh man, yeah. So this is this is something that never happened. But um, several leading movie producers have now approached Lego to make a fully animated feature movie that will reach cinemas around the world during 04 and 05. Uh, sadly, that never happened. Bionicle never reached cinemas, but um, negotiations, unfortunately, were, were short. Um, but yes, uh, that never happened. We did still get the movie, directed dvd um, They also have a lot of momentum, so they got a lot of contacts for people to work together. So that was obviously going into the future, and they've built it into a strong, profitable IP, one they expect to yield strong sales, build the LEGO brand, and drive further organizational learning. And there's uh, a sneak peek at what's coming in 2002-2003. Honestly, this document is almost kind of sad for me to read. Like, it's so clear how exciting Bionicle was to LEGO. It clearly made a huge impact. There's multiple points here where they call out that they were spending, like, the entire force of the company is behind this, right? The entire force, the entire company is behind Bionicle. A very, very different time, but 
that is what this document is. Super interesting. I hope you enjoyed. It's one of the shorter ones you're going through. Some of the other ones are really long. So this is probably going to be one of the shorter videos, but I really wanted to go in depth into this fascinating document. I really hope you enjoy this look at the Bionicle story. And please contact me if you are a LEGO employee and you're allowed to share this or if you happen to have picked it up over the years. If you've got this document for other themes because it said it's just the first in many other documents, please let me know because I would love to be able to share that with people and be able to read through it because this is the kind of stuff I find fascinating. And once again, big, big thank you to the incredible Christian Faber for giving this to me, sharing it. And who knows? This copy might be even given away when we reach 200,000 subscribers. We'll have to see about that, but that is all I have to say about this particular document. It is easily the most professionally put together one because this is distributed around the company. And I hope you enjoyed this special look at an internal LEGO document, something we never ever get to see. All right, and with that, we have summed up this very interesting internal Bionicle and LEGO document summarizing how well it was performing as a theme. What an interesting document. Again, my goal is to get all of these available in PDF form and actually release them to the public for everyone to see, which is so, so cool. I cannot believe still that we are getting a chance to get this much insight into the development of something that we're all so passionate about. So thank you to Christian Faber so much for giving me a copy of this. And you know what? Since I have two copies, I might, I might do a giveaway in the future to let someone very lucky win this copy because I do have a copy that he has signed and that one I have framed on the wall. This one's another copy. So we'll have to see. Let me know in the comments if people are interested in something like that. But overall, thank you all so, so much for watching this video, for sharing, for commenting, for liking, because there are so much more videos on the way. There are so many more. I'm so excited. And thank you once again to Christian Faber. Bye for now.